DNA gel electrophoresis is a staple in the lab. Your sample is digested with a restriction endonuclease, placed in a gel along with a buffer and some sort of dye, and then you let the electricity flow. You have your bands ready to observe. But while you can use a DNA ladder to infer the genetic information present based on the size of the fragments produced by your restriction enzyme, the exact DNA you have locked in that gel is a mystery. But it doesn't have to be, thanks to Edwin Southern. When restriction endonucleases were first discovered, the selection was limited, and what we possessed digested the DNA to the degree that gel electrophoresis in higher order animals like humans was difficult to read. From there, locating a specific gene was incredibly difficult, even if you knew roughly how large the fragment should be. One method of identifying DNA at the time was hybridization. DNA was first DNAed using saline sodium citrate buffer, then hybridized to a radio labeled DNA or RNA probe. The probe could then form a hydrogen bond with its complementary segment of DNA. The stringency of the hybridization was controlled via a combination of salt and heat. The more accurate the match, the more stable the new molecule, and the higher the temperature required to denature it again, allowing scientists to both detect DNA fragments using their complementary probe, or assess the degree of similarity by lowering the stringency to allow bonding between partial matches. The hybridized DNA could then be placed on a piece of X-ray film and left to develop its own radioactivity enough to colour the film. This technique could be applied to electrophoresized gels by carefully slicing the gel, eluting the DNA, and then hybridizing it on a filter. But the process was time-consuming, tricky, and lost the fine resolution electrophoresis could provide. What if you could hybridize the DNA right there on the gel? That didn't work. Southern found the DNA simply leached out of the gels during hybridization. The DNA had to be fixed in place somehow, but how? The answer was deceptively simple. Capillary action. After running the gels, they were soaked for one to two hours in more electrophoresis buffer containing 0.5 micrograms of ethidium bromide. This intercalated with the DNA, which became fluorescent under UV light. Images of the bands under UV light were taken to compare with the finished product. Strips were then cut and then soaked in a solution of 1.5 molar sodium chloride and 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide for 15 minutes. They were then placed in a solution of 3 molar sodium chloride and 0.5 molar tris hydrogen chloride for 15 minutes to denature the DNA within the gels. The thicker the gel, the more time required to denature. A large sheet of filter paper that had been soaked in 20 times saline sodium citrate, or SSC, was placed on a large glass surface, then covered with more SSC until visibly soaked. A piece of perspex the same height as the gel was placed on top, followed by the gel strip, then another sheet of perspex. A sheet of cellulose nitrate rested atop the gel, its sides touching the perspex sheets. Small sheets of filter paper soaked with a weaker SSC solution were placed on the edges of the cellulose nitrate, with dry filter laying on top of everything. The filter paper would draw the SSC buffer up through the cellulose nitrate, carrying the DNA along with it. But the DNA is unable to pass through, leaving it fixed in place. The larger the DNA fragments, the longer this process takes. The gel can then be peeled off, and the cellulose nitrate baked in a vacuum oven at 80 degrees Celsius. From there, it's ready to be hybridized, and you can compare the autoradiograph to the total number of bands present in your original image under UV light. Small amounts of DNA are lost in each stage, with the biggest overall loss being fragments of 500 base pairs or less. They simply didn't transfer well and were underrepresented or missing in final samples. Samples digested with EcoR1 produced larger fragments and lost 2.1% of their DNA in the denaturing solution. 1.3% in the neutralizing solution, and 0.23% of the DNA remained in the sample. Samples digested with He3 lost more DNA, 4.8% during denaturing, 44 during neutralizing, and left 0.31% in the gel due to their smaller fragment size. Using a higher concentration of SSC, and therefore a higher concentration of salt, decreases the amount of DNA lost, but increases the temperature required to hybridize the DNA, which results in a degree of loss as well cancelling out any benefit high concentrations of salt could provide. This technique is still widely used in labs today, doing everything from identifying the mutated genes in tumours, IDing bacteria, and spotting viruses in early stages of infection. There's a good chance you've heard of the Southern Blot Test. It's this very technique, named for the man who wrote this paper. Subsequent related techniques, such as the Northern and Western Blot, were also named with respect to him. It still has advantages over PCR, and variants of the technique that don't use radioactive labelling have made it more accessible than ever. This paper changed the course of genomics forever, and for that, I think we're all grateful. Hats off to you, Edwin Southern.